And House Intelligence Chairman Mike Rogers is back with us, along with CBS senior security contributor Mike Morell, who is also the former deputy director of the CIA. So it's great to have both of you who were so much involved in intelligence to talk about this. Mike, let me first talk about uh, the breaking news this morning that now ISIS or ISIL uh, has captured four towns mm -hmm. in the last two days. They're on the move. I think we're in a new phase, though, here. I think the blitzkrieg that we saw toward Baghdad um, has essentially stopped, um, and they're consolidating their position back in the West. I think that's what we're seeing now. Um, and it's just as worrisome. I don't want to downplay that at all. It's just as worrisome. But I think they're now at a, on, on a different focus than they were when they were heading towards Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Dive into who ISIS or ISIL is. Um, the leader, al-Baghdadi, was um, the head of al-Qaeda in Iraq, which later became ISIS. They split off from al-Qaeda. And I keep reading that their leader, this man right here, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, is so violent, so extreme, that he was essentially excommunicated by Ayman al-Zawari, who was bin Laden's number two. Yeah. Well, a couple of things. And one of the, just real brief, uh, briefly, when they're consolidating in the West, why that concerns us is that is a very thoughtful action for an army on the move. Mm -hmm. That they're consolidating their gains without extending themselves too far into Baghdad where they know a fight is coming. That is a thoughtful approach to what they're doing. Very, very concerning. And that's an, uh, an evolution we haven't quite seen before with uh, forces this large uh, with, that are Al Qaeda minded. So they oh, are. Oh, daddy is so extreme. He is extreme. But the, the fight with Zawahiri, think of two organized crime families. They're, they're going to fight for control. At the end of the day, somebody's going to win. They're still going to be an organized crime family. They are Qaeda minded. Uh, Baghdadi wants more territory. He wants the Levant. He wants Lebanon. He wants Jordan. They talk about Israel. And so they want to expand their Islamic caliphate. They believed that because they have a piece of Syria and a huge piece of Iraq now, that they are well underway to do that. And that makes him one of the leaders of al-Qaeda in his mind. And Nora, um, there's a long history here of tension between al-Qaeda in Iraq and al-Qaeda in Pakistan. Um, and the relationship goes up and down. Um, so it's down right now, but it doesn't need to stay down. And just to reemphasize something uh, the chairman said, their goals are the same. Their goals of attacking the United States and Western Europe are exactly the same. Well, I have a question about El Baghdadi because there are reports that he was held. We had him captured. He was at an American base um, in Camp Buka for several years, and then we let him go. And when he walked out, he told a bunch of reservists who were from Long Island, New York, he said this, quote, I'll see you guys in New York. Was that an intelligence failure, a failure by our government to let him go? I, I don't, uh, you know, it, it was a very difficult time then trying to find the right amount of evidence. Remember, he wasn't the leader then. He was someone on the rise then. Obviously, uh, this is a good lesson for us about letting people go who want to return to the fight right away, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's a little easier Monday morning quarterbacking that sure. particular decision. But I can tell you this is something that we're going to have to deal with in the days, months ahead. There are a lot of individuals who are being held where there are discussions to let go. That is very, very troubling, and I hope we'll have some reconsideration about what fight or what, where they're going to participate in the fight against and the And then who interests. are the fighters that are joining al-Baghdadi and ISIS? I mean, there are reports that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of these ISIS militants who are from Western countries, and they have European passports. So I think you can think of ISIS as three groups. So the original al-Qaeda in Iraq, which are largely Iraqis, and then you've got a group of um, Syrians who joined um, ISIS when, when, when ISIS first showed up in Syria, and then you've got this group of Westerners. So a, a significant percentage of the Westerners who have gone to Syria to fight ended up with ISIS. And some of them are from the United States, and yes, some of them have U.S. passports. Do we know who they are? Um, not all of them. I mean, obviously, our intelligence services are working overtime to try to figure out. As well, we're working with our European allies to try to determine. So remember, if you have a, 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 a European passport, I mean, you don't have to I mean, get here with a visa. That's are, what's so troubling. But when you say that, you know, that they went, the Americans in Syria that are now up with this group, right. people in America want to know, do we know who they are, and are they going to be able to get back on a plane to the United States? So, so in some cases, but yes, and in some cases, no. You have to realize how easy it is to get to Syria. So all you have to do is fly to Turkey, and cross that border, and nobody knows you're in Syria. Um, so it, it, it's difficult to track these people. 
Now, I'm absolutely certain that my former colleagues are, are working as hard as they can to do that, but it's not easy. And remember, we have, these are U.S. persons. These are U.S. citizens. It, it's a higher standard for uh, our ability to try to find them and track them and look for them in a way that we don't have to use when, when it's a terrorist from a foreign country. I, I think one of the other concerns, obviously we're talking about the territorial gains and al-Baghdadi's goals, too, about what he wants to do in ISIS, but also their funding. I mean, everything I'm reading about that, a U.S. official is quoted in the New York Times today saying ISIS is, quote, among the wealthiest terror groups on the planet. Where are they getting their money? So two sources. Um, one is um, from um, wealthy um, Arabs who have long supported Al Qaeda. Um, and from which countries? From all the Gulf countries, right? And and Qatar, uh, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. UAE. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, Jordan. Um, and these are people who have been supporting Al Qaeda all along, and they they give their money to the most successful group. And so the success that we're seeing on the ground today is drawing in more money. The other place they're getting money is from Iraq. When they overrun a city, they gather all the money that happens to be available in that city. They are a very wealthy terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. They also have a very sophisticated social media campaign. They have used Twitter and other things to recruit other jihadists to the area, as you both know. They had this tweet using some pretty dark humor that went viral where they included purportedly this image of First Lady Michelle Obama, where she had held up that sign that said, bring back our girls, and then they added that to say, bring back our Humvees. Why are they able to operate so freely, this group? I mean, they can do social media like that. Why can't we get them? This is what happens when you have a safe haven, right? This is what Al-Qaeda did prior to 9-11. Um, this is what Al-Qaeda did when they had freedom of movement in the Fatah. You're able to do those kinds of things when you have that safe haven, when you control that territory. So this seems very, very scary because they do seem to not only have a safe haven that they've already established, as you pointed out, in western Iraq and gaining ground, um, but they may have designs on Jordan. We keep hearing about Jordan. I think you know, the secretary is going to be headed there uh, on this trip as well. What's the concern there? Yeah, it, it's not that they may have designs on Jordan. Yeah, they do, do have that. designs on Jordan. So think of the government of Jordan now it has hundreds of thousands of refugees that are acting as a destabilizing factor for the government of Jordan. Hard to keep them. They had to build housing for mm -hmm. them. Imagine if hundreds of thousands of people showed up uh, on your border and you, try, you have to take care of them. That's a destabilizing factor. And you have Al-Qaeda sympathizers in Jordan who uh, don't support the United Kingdom. And now you've got on the border these Al-Qaeda-minded individuals who are now on the border between Jordan and Syria that they've had to face before. Border has opportunities for crossing too, and that's what's so concerning. So I'm concerned about Jordan too. Um, I'm also concerned about Lebanon, where ISIS um, has been quite active um, over the last several months and just in the last couple of days conducted a bombing there. So they are also focused on Lebanon, which mm -hmm. is also fragile, as you know. Mm -hmm. What steps now can the United States take? I mean, the Wall Street Journal had a great piece yesterday that the U.S. government has been aware of the threat of ISIS for some time, was going to do something about it, but didn't really provide a large enough team back in January or in the winter time to do something. Did we, did we miss the ball on this? I mean, were we slow to act and prevent this growth of ISIS? So let me just jump in with, a, with the intelligence piece of this, and then yeah. Mike can deal with the policy piece. <laughs> it's a lot tougher. But I've read you know, several times that this is an intelligence failure. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was essentially defeated when the U.S. military left at the end of 2011. And the intelligence community monitored the growth of Al-Qaeda post-2011 in great detail um, with intelligence reporting, with analysis. Um, we made very clear that this, that this group was becoming more and more dangerous. So why didn't we take action? Well, again, we, the intel and I agree, it was not an intelligence failure. We watched them pool up in the east of Syria in a way that we've never seen before. Thousands and thousands of them saw the Westerners starting to pour in. But was there a policy failure to work on what that intelligence was yes. showing us? Yes, that I have to agree was a policy failure because, remember, not taking action is a decision. And many of us who were calling for a more robust engagement in Syria uh, and again, this isn't uh, the 101st Airborne Division, it's not troops on the ground. We have lots of other options. And our argument at the time was if we don't do something to disrupt their growth in eastern Syria, we are going to be in serious trouble. We watched them grow. 
Then we watched them launch an attack from eastern Syria, a safe haven, into Iraq. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, this has been so concerning. People say, oh, intelligence wasn't there. Intelligence was there. We didn't do anything in Syria. We didn't do anything when they took Fallujah. We didn't do anything when they took Mosul. They got into Tikrit, and somebody said, hey, this is a problem. Well, no kidding. All right. Chairman Mike Rogers, yeah. Mike Morrell, great to have both of you. Really interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Nora. And we'll be right back.